Welcome to the Portland Pentecostals podcast. We're happy you've decided to join us as we build a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. Enjoy the message. We are going to go to 2 Corinthians 12 and 10. This is from the Holman Christian Standard Bible. So, I take pleasure in weaknesses, insults, catastrophes, persecutions, and impressures because of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Joel 3, verse 10, from the King James Version. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. In the Holman Christian Standard Bible, this exact same verse. Beat your plows into swords and your pruning knives into spears. Let even the weakling say, I am a warrior. We're going to talk this morning for just a few minutes about weaklings. Can we pray right now? Jesus, we thank you for this time of worship that we've had. We thank you that we can feel your spirit near us today. God, there's a work that you want to do. God, there's something that you want to do. God, let your word God, let it speak. Lord, you see, I'm an imperfect messenger, but God, you are perfect in all your ways. So we ask that, Lord, even through this, God, through this lisping and stammering tongue, God, we ask that you would come. You would come. Let your presence come. Let your spirit come. God, and let your word speak. God, we believe that your power is here. God, so we ask that you would do that work that you are wanting to do this morning, and we trust you in that in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Weaklings. Luke 4 and 18. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is Jesus speaking in the synagogue early on in his ministry. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Ten chapters later, Luke 14. And he said unto them, this is Jesus telling a parable in the same book. A certain man made a great supper and bade many. He invited a lot of people, in other words. And sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all, with one consent, began to make excuse. The first said to to him, I bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go see it. I pray thee have me excused. Can't come. Real estate deal. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee have me excused. Can't come. Cattle. And another said, I have married a wife. And therefore, I cannot come. Can't come, woman. So we're going to focus on this verse. This is where we're really getting to. Forget those guys, okay? Forget those guys. We don't need those those guys. Okay. That servant came and showed his Lord these things. And the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. The poor. Anybody ever been poor? And if you haven't ever been poor, have you ever been broke? They're just slightly related. They're slightly related. So sometimes maybe if you, you, know, you do your Excel spreadsheet or you do your QuickBooks or whatever it is that you do at home, and then you look at the numbers and you're like, oh, oh, that don't look good. There's nothing that doesn't look very hopeful. Maybe you grew up. And you don't have, you just did without. You grew up in that setting. You grew up in that circumstance. And you didn't quite have enough. And it was always a stretch. The poor. We're going to invite them to the dinner. The maimed. People that are incomplete. What does it mean to be maimed? That means you're missing parts of your body. And, you know, we we have people that, you know, here at Portland Pentecostals, they're like physically, literally, they've had injuries and stuff like that. 
But if they, even if they haven't had those injuries, there's people that gather here every single Sunday and they have missing pieces. There's things that are incomplete in their life. So we talk about the maim, then we talk about something similar, the halt or the lame. When, when you're lame, you struggle getting there. You can't get there quite as fast as the average person. The journey takes a little bit longer because you're lame, because you're injured, because you have hangups, you have stuff that slows you down. And in a Sunday morning at Portland Pentecostals, every Sunday we have people that are lame. I know that sounds like an insult to some of you. <laughs> but you're lame. The blind. People that can't see. We've had people that come in here, they literally are blind. They're, they, they can't physically see. But even if it's not a physical thing, it's something where they, they can't quite... And the people, they go to Bible studies. They get invited to maybe a midweek Bible study. They're in a home Bible study. They're in exploring God's word with our awesome chart that's out there. They're in exploring God's word, and they come to the first lesson. It's like, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't, I'm having trouble understanding, comprehending, perceiving what the word of God is saying. They don't even know. They don't even know exactly what it is. They just know that they feel compelled. They just know that they got an invitation. And they said, yes. And I commend this church because you didn't wait for your healing. You didn't wait for your restoration. You didn't wait for the check in the mail. You didn't wait for the restoration of your sight to come and be a part of the feast. Because sometimes that's not the order in which it happens. Sometimes you don't fully understand the word, every verse, every thing, every syllable, every nuance every original language translation. You don't understand all that stuff. And yet God came and he called you. He came and invited you and you came. You accepted the invitation. That's God's plan. That's God's plan. There's another group of weaklings. Luke 14, 22. That's just the next verse. We're picking right up after 21. So the last one was talking about the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind. And the story continues on. That wasn't the end of what's going on here. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded. And yet, there is room. Okay. Okay. We got another group of people. And the Lord said unto the servant, go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. And I've been doing this long enough to know that it's so easy in church, especially if you're on a Sunday service, it's so easy to assign myths to people. And especially you're dressed all nice, you're looking presentable, you made sure that you showered and you did your your hair and all the stuff or whatever. And, you know, I think, well, you know, Eli must be like, he's probably third or fourth generation Pentecostal. You know, I think I heard rumors that his dad has a, has a Spanish language church that's super successful. I think it's out there in Ohio or something. Um, <laughs> totally, yeah, absolutely not true. Absolutely not true. I'm one of these people. I'm one of these people. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a preacher's kid, man. I'm not. That's just my story. People lost in the flow of life out on the highways. I think about the wounded man in the parable of the Good Samaritan. And they're on the side of the road. They're out on the highways. You think about Jonah going down the road in the absolute wrong direction. And yet here, right here in Portland... There's going to be someone tomorrow afternoon right there, some man that does not know, stuck in traffic on I-205 that's trying to find direction for his life. And one of you people works with him. One of you people is neighbors with that lady that's out on the highway. And you are going to tell them about Jesus. You are going to tell them about that hope. You're going to be the one that's going out to the highways, that's going to be out seeking for those who are lost. The hedges, people that are lost in the margins. 
If the Son of Man truly did come to seek and to save that which, which was lost, that means there's some searching going on. I think that's why he gave us the parable of the lost sheep, the lost son, the lost coin. And some of you guys know what that's like, lost in your sin, lost in your addiction, lost in your depression. It wasn't easy to find you. But someone came out into the hedges, and they're digging through the mess. They're searching, they're rustling through. What's going on here? There's people that they've lost. They've, futility is what you knew. You were living life on the margins, living life on the edges. And yet, you needed someone to come find you. And that's how the invitation came to you. He found you on the edge. Footnotes in society, sideshows, irrelevant people. Who are you? Where'd you come from? Well, I don't know. I just came in here. I was invited. I was invited. Uh, you know, I was just minding my own business. And then someone came digging through and all of a, they found it. They said, hey, there's more. Yes, really. There's more to life. There's more. God loves you. God has purpose for your life. God has a meaning for your life. God has a calling for your life. You're there in the hedges. And you came. And if we're going to talk about assigned myths, truth is, I, we, I probably have about 12 people in my family that receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Um, many more that have heard the truth of the gospel. None of them are walking in truth as I know it. None of them. It's me. Actually, I'll back that up. There's two more of us. There's two more of us that are sitting right here in this place today. <laughs> but I'm educated enough to know that, you know, in this group of people, I'm not talking to people that, like, your grandpa was, like, the brush harbor preacher. That, <laughs> that's not your story, man. That's not your story. Wasn't an international evangelist. He wasn't the missionary. Didn't have the name. Didn't have the pedigree. And so that's why I've come to this talk to this very particular group of weaklings. We've talked about people on the highways and the hedges. We've talked about the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind. But I want to talk to these people. Literally, this is the last group. How am I doing? How am I doing? Am I? I'm, yeah. Usually I try not to make it too long. I want to go shorter. Shorter than Pastor Hanson, longer than Philip. <laughs> That's my goal. I'm just trying to fit right in that gap. <laughs> this group of weaklings is the one with generational curses. Number 16, one through three. Now Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and Dathan, and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, and sons of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men, and they rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown, and they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and, he, and said unto them, Ye take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them. And the Lord is among them. Wherefore, then lift ye up yourself, yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. And we're going right to 26 and 10, which is 10 chapters later. This is the result of what Korah and his friends said. And the earth opened up her mouth and swallowed them up together with Korah, and that company died. What time the fire devoured 250 men and it became a sign. People on the margins, people on the hedges, people on the highways, the poor, the maimed, and the people with generational curses. Some of you, the things that you saw, 
the things that you saw coming up, the things that you saw when you were, when you were little. People, parents, grandparents, uncles and aunts on the edge of God's judgment. The lifestyle that they were living was not right. And whether you involved yourself in that or whether you did not, that affected you, that impacted you. And you can be like the prophet Elijah when he declared in 1 Kings that I'm no better than my father's. It's so easy to feel that way. It's so easy to carry that weight. And people carry that weight for years. They're gripped by it. They're crushed by it. And that family should have been cut off. But we're going to the next verse, Numbers 26 and 11. Notwithstanding, the children of Korah died not. It's the thing about familiar spirits. We've talked about that within the last couple of weeks here at Portland Pentecostals. Familiar spirits. What does that, what is the word familiar? What does that bring up in your mind? Family. There's something to be said about Learn behavior. It's a very simple concept. You were brought up all around drugs. The more likelihood, you know, of you being involved in drugs or being chased by that curse is higher in your life because you were around that, because you were raised with that. You were raised with anger. You were raised with alcoholism. You were raised with depression. You were raised with anxiety, and that tends to want to cling to you, tends to want to attach itself to you, to you, to your family name, to what you're all about. But we see that the children of Korah died not. Let me introduce you to the ministry of the sons of Korah. The sons of Korah wrote 11 psalms. Psalm 42, Psalm 44, Psalm 45, Psalm 46, Psalm 47, Psalm 48, Psalm 49, Psalm 84, Psalm 85, Psalm 87, and Psalm 88. The most famous man of which is Samuel, the prophet. He was a descendant of Korah. And I'm telling you these things, and really I'm getting pretty close to wrapping up here, to make sure that we end this false perception of where the enemy would like to tell you that you're at in life. Deuteronomy 24 and 16. The fathers shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. This is Old Testament here. Now, we're going to stay in the Old Testament. We're going to talk about the New Covenant. Jeremiah 31 and verse 29. In those days, they shall say no more. The fathers have eaten a sour grape, and the children's teeth are set on edge. Can we go to 30? And we'll just stay on 30 for a second. For everyone shall die for his own iniquity. Every man that eateth the sour grapes, his teeth shall be set on edge. Now, when we're in our society, in, the, in our culture, the way that we have our slang and our sayings or whatever, when we say that you got sour grapes, what does that mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like those shoes, bro. What kind of shoes are those? Those are cool. Those are like kind of a, I'm colorblind, so I don't know. They're brown. They're brown. Okay. Uh, they're brown. They're kind of like this cool shade of brown. I, mean, I hate brown shoes. They're lame. Yeah. And what it is, is really that I got sour grapes because he has the shoes and I don't, and I don't have enough money to buy them. And so what happens is we get mad, we get upset, and we start projecting all these things because we believe that there are things that is not possible for us to attain. And the scripture says, it is not going to be that way. You will not have sour grapes. You're... If the fathers have see eaten sour grapes, the cliche in their culture was that the children, they pucker up because of what their father tasted. Let's go on. There's 30. Every man that eateth the sour grape, his teeth shall be set on edge. Verse 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. 
not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. I want you to catch this. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of the Lord, with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. One more, one more, one more. And these shall teach no more. Every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Your family name should be shame, but God takes that that shameful thing, and he applies his name to it, and he makes it new. Before we wrap up, let me tell you about the ministry of the descendants of Korah. Psalm 42 and verse 11. These weaklings, these losers, this is what they had the audacity to write. When shame is overwhelming, why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. When I, don't, when I can hardly raise my head, when I can hardly look myself in the eye. These weaklings, these people that had shame in their past, they bore the shame of their father. They said, why am I cast down? I'm going to look to God. I'm going to praise God. He is the health of my countenance. He is the health of my countenance. Psalm 46, 1 and 4. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, Selah. Next verse. There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. No, I did not talk to Sister Elizabeth Canifax when we did this. I had no idea. I don't think we sang that song in a year or two. Let me tell you, when things come crashing down in your life and all the failures of your past, all the failures of your father's past, your mama's past, they come calling for you. You can say, I will rejoice. There's a river that came and it healed me. It came and refreshed me. It came and it washed my sins away. And I will rejoice. Oh, and when you don't feel like coming to church, Psalm 84 and verse 10. The sons of Korah were crazy enough to write for a day. And I courts is better than a thousand. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. I don't feel like doing it sometimes, but I'm committed. The invitation came to me. The invitation came to me. And I'm not qualified. And I'd rather be a loser here than to go back out there. Psalm 47 and 1. And when you don't feel like worshiping when you actually get to church, the sons of Korah said, Oh, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. I don't feel like going to church. I can hardly lift my head. I've got so much shame in my life. I've got so much brokenness in my life. But I'm going to come and I'm going to be victorious. Psalm 46 and verse 10. And this right here gives me an amazing amount of strength. When you can't find the words to pray. These weaklings offered up this. Be still and know that I am God. I don't know 
how to be it. I don't know how to say it. My daddy didn't teach me. My mama didn't teach me. I didn't have the grandma that prayed sitting there and the, looking out the window, all those stories. I love to hear them. I do. If that's your, your family story, man, that's awesome. I'm thankful for it. I'll draw strength from it. But that's not my story. That's not how I was raised. That's not how I came up. And sometimes I don't know all that stuff. But I can still just be quiet in his presence. I can still just abide with him. I don't have all the prayers down. I don't know the verses maybe like I should. Psalm 42 and 2, last one on this. When you know you don't deserve it and your own strength, you just take that time and be still. Deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water spouts. All thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. If we could all stand. Weaklings, this is your week. <laughs> You're not qualified enough. You don't have all the right tools at your disposal. You don't have the background. You don't have the history. Oh, but I have one thing. That's an invitation. Let the weakling say, I am a warrior. John 88 verses 36. Just right there. If the son, therefore, shall make you free. Ye shall be free indeed. This is Eli's translation of that. If Jesus sets you free, you're really, really free. There's no doubt about it. So my daddy might be an alcoholic. But you can call me free. My family might struggle with depression so bad. can't hardly look themselves in the mirror you can call me victorious you can call me invited you can call me free hey I might have wrestled with it and maybe I still do but give me the belt because I know I'm a champion throw me my flowers because I know the fight is fixed I know in the end I'm victorious So I might be a son of Korah. You can call me a worshiper. Call me a warrior. If we could have somebody come, we're just going to come and pray. Maybe you don't know God. Maybe the first time that you've come as that weakling is today. Oh, but you can experience him this morning. Every weakness, every inadequacy, every frustration, every guilt, every shame. Bring it to the feet of Jesus. You are not bound by that curse. You are not bound by the curse of your father. You are not bound by the curse of your mother because Jesus says you are invited. Jesus says you're free.